I had survived something that pretty much everyone else, most everyone else doesn't survive. That I was supposed to be dead by the doctor's hand and I was alive. And, and knowing that God had a purpose for my life that he was calling me to. And part of that then meant standing up for those who didn't have a voice. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. Um, we first met, I think, I was reminded, like eight years ago now in yeah. Ireland, yeah. <laughs> of all places. Now we're in California. Yeah. Um, but you were all of, I think, 19, giving your one of your first speeches ever mm -hmm. at this big conference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell me about that. What was that like for you? I mean, we're going to get into your story. You have an amazing yeah. story. Yeah. Um, but this was, you, you basically started doing your public story sharing about your life, very personal life at age 19. How did that happen, that event? Yeah, so it, it, was, it was a really crazy thing, actually. I had um, started um, getting involved in a pro-life group mm -hmm. uh, in my town, and I'd been involved in a couple of different things, and a video or two had been made, and the next thing I know, I was receiving an email from this a uh, doctor in Ireland asking me to come uh, like, share, sure. at their, share at their national convention. I actually thought it was a scam at first. That's hilarious. I, I, I told my parents, you know, because I was still in high school. I was like, hey, like I've got this email from a- oh, you were in high school. I was in high school, oh yeah. Gosh. I was like, I've got yeah. this email from a doctor in Ireland asking me to come speak at something. And, and my dad just like, well, respond. Maybe it's not a scam. And so I said, okay. So I responded. And then next thing I know, we were making these plans and they're having us out there. And it was, it was a crazy experience. Um, one I never thought, uh, would happen. Um, but the Lord, he used it and, mm -hmm. um, he's opened up uh, other doorways since then. And so it's been a real blessing to uh, be able to serve him, uh, in that way through sharing my story. And we're going to get into the events leading up to this crazy time where you're all of a sudden going internationally and speaking. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for a little bit of people to get some of your background, you know, you've been even in um, Super Bowl commercials that were filmed and then rejected by the network because it was mm -hmm. so controversial. So I think many people, when they learn your story, they'll understand why this kind of cuts to the heart of some of the greatest controversies today, but you're this living, walking witness to, yeah. to life. Um, so I want to kind of go all the way back to um, little baby Josiah, yeah. you know, um, tell me about your childhood. Yeah. So, uh, I'm adopted. I was actually uh, raised in Norman, Oklahoma. I'm adopted from South Korea. I'm one of 12 kids, That's awesome. uh, 10 of us <laughs> being adopted. And so my dad is a pastor of worship at the church I grew up in. He's been a pastor there my entire life. So I was raised a church rat. Um, I was, you know, I was at the church. Uh, before the doors were open, I was there well past them being closed, running around with the, the deacon's kid, uh, raised in a very um, pro-life home. My parents mm -hmm. showed it in the way that mm -hmm. they answered the call of the gospel to mm -hmm. adopt children. And so, uh, you know, we wrote, we were raised in a home where we were all pro-life. We knew what it meant to be pro-life. Um, if I'm honest with you, though, I really, for the majority of my childhood, didn't really care mm. that I was pro-life. I, I understood we were pro-life, we said we were pro-life, um, but it didn't seem to affect me or affect my daily living. And so I really didn't pay a lot of attention to this idea of being pro-life throughout most of my childhood. Did the normal childhood kid things, you know, did sports, did Boy Scouts, did, uh, you know, church choir, all that sort of stuff, um, all the way um, until, I was a uh, eighth grader, so I was 13 years old, and my adopted parents uh, thought I was old enough to know more about my story, mm -hmm. and so they decided to set me down and tell me about the circumstances leading up to my adoption. And that's and, and at that point, you knew you were adopted. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So both my parents are Caucasian. I'm, okay. I'm obviously <laughs> like, Asian. I'm there, adopted. <laughs> yeah. Throughout my childhood, there's never a question whether or not I was adopted, and that wasn't anything yeah. that my parents tried to hide. Yeah. And you, had, you knew all your, a lot of your siblings were adopted, mm -hmm. it sounds like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, my siblings, we, we have uh, a number of different ethnicities in mm -hmm. my family. So my parents have adopted uh, two kids from South Korea, two from Haiti, uh, two African American children, three part Native American, uh, part African American. And one of my sisters is 
uh, part, part Caucasian, part Hispanic, and I have two Caucasian brothers. Wow. So we're, we're a, kind of a melting awesome. pot of everything. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that was never yeah. a question whether or not uh, we were adopted. Mm-hmm. And that was something that my parents highlighted um, what and was praised that, the fact what was that, that we like? were adopted. What was that like to grow up? Um, well, first of all, you, you probably were in the home and you watched other kids being adopted, right? Because mm-hmm. you're where, where are you in the lineup? So I'm a middle child. Okay. So I have five older siblings and six younger siblings. Okay. First of yeah. all, big families are the best. I'm one of eight. Yeah. So, but you you have especially amazing and interesting big family. So you're you're growing up. So you had kids being adopted mm-hmm. while you were little. Yeah. So you watched the family yeah. grow. Um, what was that like? Uh, it it was actually really exciting. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> for the most part, adoption processes take quite a while. Mm-hmm. And so whenever we start a process, there's always this anticipation of, oh, I've, maybe I've seen a picture of um, who's about to be my, or who is my sibling, and we're just waiting to get them home. And so there's always like this anticipation of um, a new sibling coming and having somebody coming into our family and our family growing. There's also sometimes there are surprises. Um, a couple of my siblings, they were like a phone call, hey, we've got, uh, we've got this child who was just born and uh, needs to be adopted. And a few weeks later, we're in uh, a Baptist children's home and we're receiving my little sister. Wow. Um, and so it's really crazy, it's really exciting. Um, there's there's always so much anticipation though, mm-hmm. knowing that we were, we were getting uh, somebody added to our family, another sibling. Um, and you know, it's such a beautiful thing. My parents, they, they consistently pointed it back to the gospel that mm-hmm. you know, God has adopted us into his mm-hmm. family. He's made us his children. And in the same way, we now get to um, take these children who don't have homes, don't have mm-hmm. parents, um, parents in the picture, and we get to bring them into our family and, and they're added into our family like we're added in the family of God. And so it's, it's mm-hmm. always just a, a really great experience there's this thrill to it um you know the the best not to equate people with puppies but you know when you think about like as a kid and it's like oh we're getting a new puppy and like how exciting that is think about it like 10 times that though because it's like we're we're getting we're getting a new sibling and i mean i had i'm five younger and um, growing up i was like another baby's coming and is it a boy or a girl and like all that that same anticipation but you actually sounds like your parents brought you into the process you actually sometimes even saw pictures Mm -hmm. of your siblings before they would be adopted so it was like that's definitely added suspense there to have that yeah yeah what what inspired them to do to i mean were all of you guys adopted all 12 uh so 10 of us are adopted uh my two oldest brothers um they're not adopted my parents actually my mother, um, into their marriage, uh, she had had a number of miscarriages. Mm-hmm. And so they had already started looking towards adopting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what really started them on the road, um, it's, it's beautiful the way God worked it. Uh, my mother was serving, she was volunteering in a crisis pregnancy center. And, and a young woman came in who was pregnant, who was adamant she had to have an abortion. And my mother, she sat there and she counseled her. And, and this young lady eventually got to the point, she said, well, if I keep the baby, will you adopt? Mm-hmm. Will you adopt the child? And and my parents, um, my mom being who she was, said, "Well, well, yeah, we'll adopt her." And of and course, that was her first. Th- this baby. was her first adoption, mm-hmm. so of course, cell phones aren't a thing then <laughs> and stuff. And so she has to go home, tell my dad. But <laughs> by the way, we have yeah, another. We're, tell, we're tell, have tell him baby. that they're you know wow. that this happened, and then you know they didn't hear from her for a little bit, but then she ended up uh, having a little girl, and uh, my parents adopted her, and they were. She was their first adoption, and that started them on the road. Um, wow! And it's it's really amazing to see. Uh, for me, it's been really amazing to see my parents um, adopt because e- each of our stories are unique, and and only probably about half of their adoptions, I would say, were they actually seeking out the adoption wow. first. Um, and so it's always been interesting to see how those processes have played out mm-hmm. and how they've been faithful to follow. God's leading to mm-hmm. take these kids, take us um, into their home and make us a family. Wow. And so you were saying it was not until eighth grade mm-hmm. that you learned about the circumstances of your adoption. Mm-hmm. Um, can you share about that? So up until this time, adoption is very positive. You mm-hmm. have this big, huge family. Yeah. Um, what was what was that like when you, and what did you learn yeah. in eighth grade? Yeah, so, so when I was 13, um, I became a teenager and my parents, they thought I was old enough to know more about my story. Uh, as an adopted kid, uh, one thing you're always wondering is your history. 
where did I come from? What were the mm-hmm. circumstances leading up to me being adopted? It's um, it's just part of us to want to know, mm-hmm. you know, do I look more like my mom? Do I look more like my dad? You know, these different things that as, um, you know, children with, you know, with their biological parents, they don't necessarily have some of these questions, but, you know, there's these, those questions. Um, just where did I come from? Uh, what's my family history? And so my parents, um, there's a very important part of the circumstances of my adoption that they had left out until they believed I was old enough to be able to to process it, understand it, um, accept it, work through it. They told me uh, at 13 about how my birth mother in South Korea, two months into her pregnancy with me, uh, had a DNC abortion. And so um, at two months, she went in, had the abortion. They thought the abortion had been successful and they sent her home. Uh, A few months later though, she realized that the abortion had actually failed um, and that I was still very much so alive. And so at that point, she kept me, she carried me to term, and I was born later on October 7th, 1995. Uh, I have a deformed arm, uh, as you can tell. Uh, whether or not that's a direct cause of the abortion, we're not positive. I can tell you, in my mind at the age of 13, I went, that's why I have a deformed arm. That's why I am the way I am. Uh, considering the circumstances of the abortion, the type of abortion, it's, it's very likely mm-hmm. that um, that has caused the deformity that that I grew up with. And so they told me this at the age of 13. And as I mentioned before, you know, I grew up in a pro-life home. I grew up in a pro-life mm-hmm. family, a pro-life church. But it really didn't matter to me um, because it seems so distant from me. Right? I knew abortion, abortion the, the seems so distant. The whole, the whole thing, issue yeah. of it, I knew. I knew we were pro-life, my parents proved it by the way Mm -hmm. they adopted children, but the idea of abortion, all that was so distant Mm -hmm. to me. And all of a sudden, at the age of 13, it was right there in my face. There's there's no getting around it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll tell you something, I I started to care. Mm -hmm. I definitely started to care about the issue. Uh, In reality though, I didn't care about the issue in in a good way or or in a healthy Mm -hmm. way because I couldn't see past my pain. I couldn't mm-hmm. see past my hurt. Um, what do you mean by that? What were yeah. you feeling? And, and and also growing up, you know, looking mm-hmm. different from other yeah. kids. So, so growing what was up, that like? yeah, you know, I did all the normal boy things. Mm-hmm. I, even though I had a deformed arm, I did all the things, no problem. I adapted and I was fine, but I actually struggled for a lot of my childhood. I struggled with uh, identity image, mm-hmm. uh, identity issues with self-image um, issues. I thought I was less than others because I had a deformed arm, even though I might stack up fine next to other boys my age and I might excel at different things. I still thought in my life, I wasn't gonna go anywhere mm. because of my deformed mm. arm. And, and so I, I was very self-conscious about that. But uh, did people point that out? Like, did you experience any kids treat you differently or bully you or were you pretty much protected from that. Yeah, so I, I would say I never I never had any bullies mm-hmm. growing up, right? I never had a schoolyard bully or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of ignorance though, a lot of uh, a lot of people who would just assume I was unable to do mm-hmm. this or that or people who assumed because I had a physical disability and I had a, some sort of mental disability as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can't tell you the amount of times um, I had people talk about me to my parents in front of me in a manner that was, that was very derogatory towards me. It'd be, you know, they, they would just praise my parents for taking in a handicapped child mm-hmm. or, you know, praise them for, you know, being willing to, you know, what a sacrifice it must be to, you know, raise a kid with these mm-hmm. kinds of disabilities and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of ignorance like that. So they were like uh, labeling, faced. labeling uh, in you, in uh, front of you, mm-hmm. and it, uh, almost like ignoring you as a human being, yeah, and just looking at a disability instead of as a human. Exactly, yeah, yeah. and then and then mm-hmm. directing those comments to my parents, and mm-hmm. my parents were always, you know, they're the first to to come back at them with it. My mom, she was, she is, uh, she's very fiery. She <laughs> she she's not going to take those kind of mm-hmm. comments, and she would she would correct, and um, she would she would respond back. But, but there's still those comments. There's still those different things um, that I experienced as a child. Uh, you know, I, I'd be walking down the street uh, or I'd be in a store and, you know, 
uh, I'd be scared of the little child who would look to him and say, look, mom, he's missing an arm or where's his arm at? That it, it got to me as a child. Um, and so I struggled with a lot of self-image issues uh, for a lot of my childhood. My parents weren't aware of this. Um, from a young age, I found identity in different places. Mm -hmm. And so looking back, I hid behind those mm -hmm. identities. So I found identity in being the good Christian kid. Mm -hmm. And so I did all the good Christian things. I was a kid who had all the right Bible answers when mm -hmm. Sunday school teachers asked them. And I found identity and security in that. And so I used that as a front when in reality, uh, behind the curtains, uh, I felt so invaluable. Mm -hmm. And I had such self-image issues that my parents weren't aware of at the age of 13 when they, when they shared the circumstances of my birth with mm -hmm. me. Did you tell anyone about how you were really feeling? So it, so really at the age of 13, it was kind of a tipping point mm -hmm. for me because when they told me about my birth parents' decisions, I was filled with anger and mm -hmm. hatred towards my birth parents because in my mind, I was broken. I was less than others because of the choices they had made, mm -hmm. the wrong choices they had made. But I was also filled um, with a deeper level of depression because I also at the same time had in my mind, well, here's a proof that your life's invaluable. Mm -hmm. The people who should have loved you the most, your own parents, your own flesh and blood, they thought your life was so invaluable, they tried to take it. And that, mm -hmm. and that was what was immediately going through my mind uh, at 13 years of age, knowing this. And it really, eventually it brought me to a tipping point. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it began to show in my actions, it began to show in, um, just the way I responded to things at home, particularly in a way I would respond neg negatively towards uh, one of my sisters. And, and so that kind of started to show itself. And when it started to show itself, my parents started to address it with me and they started to, to work through it with me. Um, in late elementary, I kind of started to be able to do a few more new things, you know, just because as we were getting older, we were going different places, mm -hmm. going to different camps. And there's always the new places that were the worst for me. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, at home, at church, uh, I was known there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I was just another one of the kids, right? Mm -hmm. But anytime I was gonna be in a new situation, that's when I had the most anxiety and I, and I, felt, um, I felt it the most mm -hmm. because I knew there's gonna be the stares, there's gonna be the questions. There's going to be questions that aren't in no ways are they hostile mm -hmm. or in no ways are they derogatory, just inquisitive. Mm -hmm. But that still got to me. Mm -hmm. um, I knew there's going to be the ignorant questions. Um, but really, yeah, late, late elementary has really when I can remember starting to kind of be very aware of how different I was mm -hmm. to everyone else. Um, and so I struggle with that. Parents told me at the age of 13, struggled with it even more. Uh, and the only thing that's got me here at this point in time, talking with you, being willing to share and sharing my story today is, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, like I said, my parents were devoted followers of Christ and they raised us in the church. And I went through church um, finding identity and being the good Christian kid and not, and not a bad way, but in a way that, um, you know, I just, I liked the way it made me look to others. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I saw the appeal of, you know, if I am the good Christian kid with the good Christian answers, maybe they see past mm -hmm. the broken side of me. Maybe they see past my deformity. Maybe they mm -hmm. see past all these different things. Um, but my, the sophomore the summer after my sophomore year of high school, I was at church camp and the preacher that week, his name was John Randalls, and he kept talking about this word uh, dunamis, this Greek word dunamis, which means power. And he kept talking about how as followers of Christ, as believers in him, he imparts to Christians these, this power to, to go through life, to go through the difficult circumstances, go through persecutions, overcome sin, um, and to go through this life and come on the other side victorious because of the power that Christ mm -hmm. works in us. And I remember at camp, 
being faced with this reality that I didn't have that kind of power in my life, that I said I was a follower of Christ, I did all the right Christian things, but in reality, I, I felt so worthless, I felt mm -hmm. so invaluable, I did all these things as a front to try to make myself look better, and it wasn't mm -hmm. working because I was still so broken inside. And, and I was faced with this reality that, that I needed that power in my life, that I needed forgiveness, I needed to be brought into relationship with the God in the universe through a son. And so I, I surrendered my life to him at camp. And it was, that was a big humbling experience for me because again, I'm, I was a good church kid. You know, everybody in the youth group thought I was a good Christian kid. And here I am saying, no, like I've been living this life, doing these things because I liked the way it made me look. Not because I had a relationship with Jesus. And as I found relationship with Jesus, as I found identity with Jesus, as I found forgiveness in Jesus, I was able to find forgiveness towards my birth parents. This recognition that the God of the universe loved me so much that when I was so far from him, when I was in, uh, at his very enemy, he would send his son to come die on the cross for punishment of my sins, to take the judgment I deserved, to bring me back into relationship with him to forgive me, to say, hey, I see all these wrongs that you've committed, Josiah. I see all these failures that you have on your plate, Josiah. I see all these shortcomings you have on your plate, but my son covers that up. I think a lot of people, they don't feel maybe, or they haven't reckoned with their own inadequacies, yeah. you know, their, or their own yeah. brokenness. You know, I think we have so yeah. many mechanisms yeah. to cover those up, whether it's even our own religion to cover it mm -hmm. up instead of to heal it. Yeah. Um, what did forgiving your parents, your birth parents yeah. actually look like for you? Was it something that you had to kind of write down? Yeah. You know, how did you reconcile yeah. learning that your mother tried to abort yeah. you um, and, and the deformity that you have afterwards, you know, how did you reconcile that? What did that process look like? It was a, a process because it was still a difficult thing I had to wrestle with. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still a, a regular thing you have to wrestle with this reality of, okay, I have this part of my story. I have these wrongs that were committed against me. I have, I have to live the rest of my life likely with circumstances because of their choices. You know, I can't get up one day and look in the mirror and say, no, that didn't happen. But I can get up and I can say, hey, that's part of my past, but here's the thing, that's not my future. That's not what defines me. I'm, I'm not defined by my shortcomings. I'm not defined by what I think I will accomplish, what I won't accomplish. I'm defined by the God of the universe and my relationship with him through his son. My identity isn't wrapped up in my deformity. My identity is wrapped up in my Savior. Mm -hmm. And as I find my identity more and more in Him, I find security, I find forgiveness, mm -hmm. I find love, and I find this ability to, to walk through life and be like, it's okay to, to be missing an arm. It's, mm -hmm. it's not that big of a deal. It's not the end of the world. Do you know who your biological parents are? I, I do not. Mm -hmm. So Is there a record or anything? Yeah, so I haven't done too much digging. Um, I don't know if I could find that, if I really looked into it or not. Um, but all we have are we have a, a report. Um, so on on the abortion, and then obviously we've got, you know, my birth certificate and things like that, but um, really don't have very much information on them. And how old were you when you were adopted by your parents? So I was 13 months old. So when I was born, I was immediately play, placed in a foster home ministry in South Korea before I was adopted and brought over to the States. And and what was that like for your parents? Was that their first international adoption? And did they know about mm -hmm. your disability? Like what was kind yeah. of their experience of that? Yeah, so I'm actually my parents' second international mm -hmm. adoption. So I'm their third adoption total. So they adopted my first sister, mm -hmm. which I shared earlier about how um, they came about adopting her. So my second sister that they adopted, they adopted from South Korea. And when they were actually going through the process of adopting her, they were asking the agency, okay, so we're, you know, we're uh, uh, an all Caucasian family at this point. Um, what, are there any tips and tricks, if you will, mm -hmm. to, you know, to adopting a child of a different ethnicity? And they had told my parents, well, if you adopt um, from a different ethnicity, we actually would encourage you to adopt you know, another child of the same ethnicity. 
So, you know, just growing up, they kind of have somebody who looks like them and things like that. And so my parents were already looking towards adopting again from South Korea when they adopted my older sister, Elise. Uh, uh, another way that God just showed his providence, I believe, um, because I had a deformed arm, I was considered special needs. And special needs kids are harder to get adopted out. And so the adoption agency that they adopted my sister through actually ran sort of a, a special article about me, highlighting mm -hmm. me and, you know, saying I had a deformed arm and I needed a home. And my sister, Elise, is six months older than me. So at the time, they're reading this article and they're going, this is perfect. <laughs> right. They mm -hmm. said, we, you know, we've adopted a little girl from South Korea and look at this little boy. He's he's. He's special needs, if you will, and he's only six months apart from her. If you know, we can adopt him and, and she'll be kind of that almost like a twin to kind of take care of him and look out for him growing up and things like that. And so uh, they then immediately said, "That's this is who we needed to adopt. And so they adopted me. It's actually funny. Uh, throughout most of my childhood, they adopted me and they thought, in the back of their minds, Elise will help take care of Josiah. I was going to say, did Elise follow up on um, part of the deal? In reality, <laughs> did she take care of most me? of my childhood, I actually took care of okay. Elise. <laughs> she would say differently, yeah. but if you ask the 10 other siblings, they would say, <laughs> they would say I, I took care of her more so. Do you uh, have like family councils where you guys like all meet and talk? I mean, how do you like, I'm, I'm is telling that a long you, text thread uh, with all of yeah, you guys? <laughs> you, you have not done conflict resolution until you've done it with... Uh, 11 siblings uh, I bet. throughout all our childhood. It, it was always kind of this, you just gotta get the numbers. That's what it is, you just gotta get the numbers. But the numbers meaning that, like another, you wanna uh, get your, enough yeah, siblings to you've side get, with you? You just gotta get a majority on your side and you can get what you want kind of thing. Got it, And got so it. we might we might have our differences on whatever, <laughs> but if we need this done, we'd unite and. It sounds like growing up was very rambunctious yeah. and fun <laughs> with all those siblings. Was there any special challenges um, on the adoption front, I mean, you're from all these different backgrounds. Some of you were adopted, it sounds like older than infants, so different uh, probably life experiences mm -hmm. already, maybe even traumas. Um, what were some of the challenges with that kind of upbringing? Yeah, so we we actually have qu quite a slew of backgrounds uh, with my siblings. We have some who were adopted out of abused backgrounds. We have some, uh, my oldest sister actually spent the majority of her child uh, literally living as a house slave. Um, in an orphanage. Uh, another one of um, my brothers uh, was, he was in an orphanage and he was in an orphanage that collapsed um, back when that uh, massive earthquake hit Haiti a number of years ago. And so a lot of, there's actually been a lot of traumatic uh, backgrounds. Uh, many of my siblings have, co have come from. I think the popular, it is very beautiful. I think the popular mentality today, you know, among some, especially those that would say they're pro-choice is, you know, it's better, abortion should be available and it's even often the better decision because that baby will be raised in trauma or poverty or with disability or, you know, any number of sort of factors that mean it's better that child just basically was, I mean, in their minds not being killed, even though the child is being killed in their mm -hmm. mind, the child just kind of ceases to exist, you know, yeah. doesn't exist anymore. Um, what would you say to that, that to those, those yeah. people that have that mentality? Yeah, so <laughs> I have a lot I could say to that. Um, I, I, th I guess I'll, I would first answer to what I really think is the root of that problem um, and, and the, the mindset that that response is coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what they're saying is, based upon the quality of life, that determines the value of life. Mm -hmm. um, is, is honestly a very arbitrary way of looking at life, saying, well, if they're gonna have these kind of circumstances, it'd be better for them to not have life. Mm -hmm. And it's this arbitrary line where we start going, okay, well, so then who, who decides that line? Who decides what, what is um, difficult, too difficult of experiences for to not be worth living, mm -hmm. right? Or who decides, uh, their life will be easy enough, we should let them li mm -hmm. live. Like who decides that line? Where is that line drawn? I think they would say, "Well, the mom does." Sure, sure, and and I think a lot of times um, we respond and we give kind of half of a response. 
what I hear in the pro-life community, one of the first responses then becomes, okay, well, let's point out somebody who did come from a traumatic experience mm -hmm. and who are alive today and look at their life and how mm -hmm. full of life they are, right? And so they, so they wanna come back with, you know, like you're saying their life isn't worth mm -hmm. living because they're gonna have these traumatic responses, but look at these people who had traumatic life situations and they're living a good life now, right? right? And so, and, the, and we come with that response, which I think is a good starting place. Mm -hmm. Because I think it humanizes it. It's a, just because there's difficulties, just because there's traumas, doesn't mean life is invaluable or life isn't worth living. Um, but it's half of a response because we're still using the same reasoning that they're using. They're saying this life isn't worth it because of these difficulties they're, they're facing. And they're saying, well, even with these difficulties, they can still have good life, so life is worth it. Meaning they went on to have a good life. Exactly. Even in the end, so... The difficulties exactly. happen, but they don't really matter anymore. Exactly. And mm -hmm. and so we can't stop there. We have to go, okay, so what then should be our standard of life? Right, because what about those kids who are still in the difficulty? Exactly. exactly. Or even adults who are still in the exactly. difficulty. Exactly. And, and we, have to, mm -hmm. we then have to go, okay, so we have to answer the question, so do we believe that life is good and it's good to be alive? Right? We, we have to answer that question. And then we have to answer this, a second question of, now do we think life is valuable, right? What's our metric for, is life valuable? Would we say inherently human life is valuable or do we say it's only as valuable as your circumstances? I think deep down, um, we all, it, it's sort of written innately in us. I mean, God, I believe his mm -hmm. law is written in us. His imprint is in all of us, whether we see it or not. And mm -hmm. Deep down, I mean, and, and children know it best. You know, children are innocent. You know, they're not as yeah. jaded. They're not mm -hmm. as, and you know, children when they are protected, you know, when mm -hmm. they are in, loved, they they see life as innately good. Yeah. And they see suffering as bad, but they don't see suffering as a justification to yeah. take life away. And that yeah. that innocence of life is worth living, yeah. even if it's painful, even if it's hard. Yeah. I mean, that is that that is at the heart of. I think all of us deep down yeah. that 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 desire for life because we're made for it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, and and you don't have to you don't have to be a Christian to say life is worth living and life ought to be protected and that human life is valuable. I think we in some levels we we say that, we understand that, we show that. Maybe not consistently across the board, but I mean we say that when we fight things like racism. Because we say a person of a different color, a person of a different ethnicity, their life's valuable because they're a person, regardless of what their ethnicity is. Or regardless of the way they're persecuted. Or regardless of the way they're persecuted. Because you can be horrifically persecuted, yeah. be victim of genocide and slavery and exactly. horrific you know, institutionalized racism. And that doesn't mean your life isn't worth living. Exactly. So we wouldn't say it to them. Why would we say it, to the ch mm -hmm. say it about the child? Yeah. What was it? So you're in high school. You have this reckoning with your own heart and brokenness, your own story of your adoption and um, being aborted mm -hmm. and surviving. Um, when did you start doing pro-life work? I mean, when did you start first? I mean, Ireland was your first big international speech, yeah. but when did you start kind of publicly share, sharing your story? Yeah, so I would, I'd really say before I even started speaking, kind of where it started was I, I just knew I needed to do something. And, and why? What was that like? Because you knew about abortions happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, was it was it kind of an awareness of other children who were being aborted? Because every day there's 2,300 yeah. abortions on average in America alone. So was that part of it? Or was it more just like this is a way to continue to forgive and to heal? It, was, it, it, was, this, it was this understanding that I had survived something that pretty much everyone else, most everyone else doesn't survive that I was supposed to be dead by the doctor's hand and I was alive. And, and knowing that God had a purpose for my life that he was calling me to, and part of that then meant standing up for those who didn't have a voice like I was all those years ago. And so we had a local pregnancy center and I was like, I was a high school, I was like, I don't need to be I don't need to be in a clinic trying to <laughs> counsel, counsel people. I don't Maybe need to be doing role. that. Okay. I don't need to do that. Uh, but I can, I can clean. I, I was a janitor at my church. That's what I did for a job in high school. And so I started to just 
uh, like on a bi bi monthly basis, just serving there, just cleaning, mm -hmm. um, cleaning the cleaning the pregnancy center, center for them, and um, getting involved with our pro life um, organizations that have been forming um, just at our church and stuff. And a blog started. I feel like everything starts with a blog. That's everything true. starts with a blog, um, <laughs> or a tweet, and or something. something. And and so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are people are writing blog posts, and so I was like, okay, I think I need to, I need to write my story and share it. Um, if I found it today, I'm not even sure what it said. I, <laughs> it probably isn't something I'd be proud of today. Um, but and he just started opening doors. Um, so the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. you were part of an ad mm -hmm. of abortion survivors, little vignettes of your stories. And my understanding is that the makers of the commercial had the backing to actually pay for this to be aired at the Super Bowl, but the network rejected it. It wasn't a graphic ad, it was literally mm -hmm. just your faces as survivors of abortion. Um, what was what was that like for you to be part of that? And for it to be rejected? Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, when they first asked me to be a part of the project, I was like, that's really cool. And I, <laughs> and I thought, are they gonna let them do that? Um, and so, so, so I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. When they when they rejected it, rejected it. As and who say. was the network that, uh, that rejected it? I can't quite remember. Okay. Was it was it CBS or was it ABC? I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to misnamed. The I don't want to misname the one that it was. It, it was, was Fox. Fox? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Fox. Slam them. No, okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fox of all of all networks, it was yeah. Fox. Um, but it it honestly didn't surprise me. Um, and this was just a commercial of literally yeah. the faces of abortion survivors yeah. saying that you survived abortion, which yeah. is a fact. Literally, yeah. it's a documented fact. And it was so not graphic. It wasn't even a political. It was just saying this is yeah. this is your story. Yeah. Um, and they they had the money, and the Fox and the Super Bowl refused to air it. Yeah. It was, and and if you ask them, if you look at the stuff, they would say mm -hmm. we didn't refuse to air it. They would say you know they didn't get all the things in on time or they didn't do mm -hmm. this or that. But to my knowledge, everything was lined up. All our ducks were in a row. Um, the money was there, the forms had been filled out, the requests were in, everything was taken care well, of. We'll just try again the next year. Um, if they yeah. didn't do it properly, yeah, they, just they've keep... already They've already been making yeah. those plans. Uh, it, but it, honestly, it, it didn't really surprise me um, because uh, it was a truth and it was a narrative that they didn't like. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it reminds us that uh, that media, social media, everything we see, everybody has a narrative and agenda that they're pushing. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, it's not one of life. Yeah, and I, I think pro-abortion advocates, I know a lot in a lot of political debates, they say abortion survivors don't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, there've been the Born Alive Infants Protection Act federally and some at the state level to try to ensure that there were legal protections for infants that survive abortion attempts, because some are just left to die, mm -hmm. um, especially in later term. And um, they just say, you don't even exist. What mm -hmm. would you say to those? Or how does that feel to have these very powerful politicians and even media groups denying your existence? It, it, it is, it's, it's such a, I would say there's some levels to where you can't even argue with it. Or you can't mm -hmm. even respond, like the, the evidence is there and for them to blatantly ignore it, for them to blatantly claim otherwise, there's almost not much you can do with it. It, it just yeah. is what it is. And you almost have to let the truth just stand out mm. there next to it. Let them make their claims and then show the opposite to be true. Um, where I found uh, in my personal experience, um, that might be the case with media, that might be the case with different politicians, but in one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. so I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people after I've shared or, or um, been a part of a project of people who said, I didn't know there were abortion survivors. Mm -hmm. I didn't know like people survive that. They make it out. Um, and to be able to say, yeah, that is the truth. And this is, I'm just a living reminder of what abortion is. Mm -hmm. I'm a living reminder of what abortion ends, the life of a human being. Um, and it's in those one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's in those times when you're able to show a face of somebody who survived an abortion to a loved one, to a friend, to a coworker, whoever it might be. That's where we'll see change starting to occur because the, the politicians, the, the media, they, they've 
made their bed where they're going to make it, if you will. They've made their decision. They've come to their uh, conclusions, but the person sitting across from you maybe hasn't. Mm -hmm. And so let's continue to, to shed light. Mm -hmm. I love that. And we see that all the time. Like people one-on-one, -on -one, separate from the narratives and the group mm -hmm. think, you know, people are very open. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this message, the prolic message, because it's true, it does deeply resonate. Mm -hmm. What was it like to meet other abortion survivors for the first time? Because I know there are many that you're close with now yeah. and that you've worked with. There's like actually a, a network of survivors in the U.S. and internationally. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, there's like an immediate sense of camaraderie. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like, as an adopted kid, when I meet somebody else who who is adopted as well, it's like there's this immediate just almost kinship of I I know so much about you, even though I might not know hardly anything about you. But we share this one common experience. We share this one common struggle with one another. And there's a lot of camaraderie and there's a lot of comfort in it. I, and I would really quickly if it's okay i would i would plug the abortion survivors mm. network that <laughs> melissa odin <laughs> yeah. has started and for anybody who might see this mm. who is just finding out they're an abortion mm -hmm. survivor who's known for a long time who's who's wondering what do i do with this how do i work through this i would encourage them to check out the abortion survivors network um, melissa's doing great work um, I'm, I'm so glad that i get to be a part of it in any way that I am, um, as we as we help people come to grips, as we help people process, as we help people work through um, these realities that so many of us are living in, whether or not we realize it, mm. whether or not we know in our culture how many there are. There's so many abortion survivors, um, even in our midst, um, who don't know it or who aren't sharing it. And so let's bring it to the light. So what do you, when you look at your life, I mean, you're still pretty young, but you've mm -hmm. done a lot in your young life and you've, um, you've lived a lot and you've shared a lot. I mean, most people aren't so public sharing something so personal. Um, what do you see going forward as you're working as a youth pastor, but as sort of your, for the pro-life movement, what do you want to see happen in, in our movement? And, and with yeah. this big fight over abortion, you know, we've legalized yeah. abortion in the United States well, globally you know, in almost every country, thankfully not all, but almost every country, it's still legal yeah. to do to children what you're, what that doctor tried to do to you. Yeah, you know, we look at the culture we live in and it, really it, it's a culture of death. We, we look at what should be the safest place on earth, a woman's womb, and it's the most dangerous place for a child. We look at what should be considered our greatest blessings, children, and we say they're a curse. We, we have full reign uh, to take those lives. We live in a culture that tells women to get ahead in life, you have to take a life. We live in a culture that tells men, hey, fulfill the indulgences of your flesh and, and you're not held accountable whatsoever for the choices you make. And all this is at the expense of the unborn. All this is at the expense of a population group who we've never heard their voices. That's a culture of death. And we see that all throughout our culture. We, we don't care about the smallest, most innocent, most defenseless life. And we see that play out in all these other areas, all these other arenas of not caring for human life and the rest of our culture. And so really what I would love to see and, and, and what I strive for is to see a culture of life. And, and I believe a culture of life can only be brought about by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a culture of death, a culture that dark, the only light strong enough to overcome that is the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as I consider what I do, as I consider how I labor, how I'm going to work, mine is all, my work is always going to be gospel advancement, kingdom advancement, because I believe at the end of the day, what's going to make the change, what's going to turn to a culture of life is the gospel of Jesus Christ changing lives. The gospel of Jesus Christ changing lives to recognize that all life is valuable and all life should be protected. The gospel of Jesus Christ that tells women that their lives are valuable and that the life of their children is valuable. A, a gospel that goes into impossible situations where we say, what kind of life would this child have if they're allowed to live? A gospel that says they need to have the chance. And so that's my goal. That's what mm -hmm. I labor for. That's 
what I believe God has put me here on this earth to do, to advance his gospel, to see lives changed, and to see Jesus receive glory. Do you think we're going to get to a point where, I mean, America, it's 60 million abortions now since 1973. Globally, they estimate in the billions of abortions. They say, I think, over 1.5 billion um, in the last three decades. Um, Billion abortions. Um, Do you think we'll get to a place in the, the U.S. where abortion is illegal? And not just illegal, but our society rejects it at large. When I look at the landscape of our politics, our culture, honestly, it's hard for me to see a day where Mm -hmm. it's illegal. It's hard for me to see that day. But I do believe we could see a day when it's non-existent because the culture changes, the people change, and we decide to start valuing and loving life from the very beginning. Thank you so much, Josiah, for coming all the way out here and sharing your story and your courage um, and all the advocacy you're doing for, for those that have no voice. Thanks for having me.